Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I've got a very interesting and unusual episode for you today. I call this one the ET Fertilizer Connection. This is a very unusual and bizarre aspect of UFO research that I don't believe has ever been explored before. And yet there are some cases where there does seem to be a connection between ETs and fertilizer. A few of these cases are well known, but some are virtually unheard of, and I definitely found out some interesting things, and because this hasn't received really any attention, I thought this would be a great topic for an episode on this show. So let's just get started. And the first case I want to talk about is probably one you've heard before. It's the first reported UFO abduction ever, and this is the case of Betty and Barney Hill, who had a UFO contact experience in 1961 in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And there is this really strange connection with fertilizer that is not well known. So that's why I wanted to really dig deeper into this, because this was the first case that really reported this bizarre connection. On September 19, 1961, a momentous event occurred which generated headlines across the world and forever changed the way humanity viewed the UFO phenomena. And this is, of course, the case of Betty and Barney Hill, who experienced two hours of missing time while driving through the White Mountains of New Hampshire. In the days and weeks that followed, they became increasingly concerned about the missing time aspect of their encounter. Betty was having dreams about being taken on board, and Barney himself was suffering from anxiety, and his condition of hypertension and his stomach ulcers both worsened, and there was various bits of evidence that proved that they had had more than just a sighting. There was Barney's scuffed shoes, Betty's torn dress, unexplained shiny spots on their car, and more. So after seeking help, they decided to undergo hypnotic regression, and the now world-famous case was revealed. So this case introduced the world to the idea of onboard UFO encounters, and before long, hundreds and then thousands of similar cases started coming in from all over the world. But again, what many people don't know about is this weird fertilizer connection. In his best-selling book, The Interrupted Journey, John G. Fuller wrote that the trip through the mountains had been an impulsive idea, and it was a largely unplanned adventure to fill the short vacation that the Hills were enjoying from their place of employment. And on the morning of the trip, the Hills loaded up their trunk with supplies, and as John Fuller writes, and I quote, As he loaded the trunk, Barney shoved a bag of bone meal fertilizer to one side and packed the luggage around it. That he had bought the fertilizer to work on the garden during the vacation. It was just as easy to let it stay in the trunk as to take it out. Later, they were to find this comfortable homey material creating an unusual inquiry and speculation. So following this encounter, Betty and Barney Hill actually went to visit Betty's sister to talk about the encounter, and Betty's niece, Kathleen Marden, remembers the event vividly. Kathleen Marden has written extensively on her aunt's case. She's now a prominent UFO researcher in her own right, and in a 2001 interview, Kathleen described what happened when Betty came over shortly after this encounter. As Kathleen Marden says, Betty, compass in hand, led us to the street where her 1957 blue and white Chevy Bel Air was parked. My mother, brother Glenn, and I peered curiously at several highly polished half-dollar sized circles while we took turns lifting my youngest brother Tommy high enough to see. Betty demonstrated the car's effect upon the compass, starting at the hood and running it over the side, back, and trunk. We watched as the needle spun wildly over the spots, but not on the side. My mother spied Glenn and myself futilely attempting to rub the spots away 
and cautioned us not to touch them for safety reasons. My mother, who was careful not to jump to erroneous conclusions, suggested that perhaps something inside the trunk was having an effect on the compass. Betty opened it and we looked at the bag of fertilizer that she had purchased but not removed. I don't remember how the needle reacted when she placed it over the bag. My mother was again becoming apprehensive about our possible exposure to radioactive material, so we were quickly shuffled back into the house. We found seats in the large living room on the opposite side of the room from my father and Barney, and Betty explained the details of her sighting while we listened intently, asking questions to satisfy our curiosity. So this is important because Kathleen Martin does verify that there was this bag of fertilizer in the Hill's trunk. So the Hill's en encounter, of course, attracted the attention of numerous researchers and scientists who were studying the UFO phenomenon, and among them were Robert Homan, a science writer, and C.D. Jackson, a senior engineer. These were both UFO researchers who were among the first to talk to the Hills, and they were hoping to obtain new insights into UFOs and their possible extraterrestrial origins. So these two men, Homan and Jackson, questioned the Hills extensively and were particularly impressed by the missing time aspect of their story. And it appeared to Betty and Barney Hill that the men were familiar with other such encounters. And they questioned them about every aspect of their UFO experience. But it was one particular question which caught both Betty and Barney by surprise. John Fuller writes about this in his book, and I'm quoting John Fuller here, as he says, Homan and Jackson inquired about many facets in the case that puzzled Barney, particularly an inquiry as to whether there were any nitrates or nitrate derivatives in the Hills car. The only thing I could think of that possibly had some connection with nitrates, Barney later said, was gunpowder. I did have about a dozen shotgun shells in the car left over from a trip to the south when I had practiced shooting at tin cans on my uncle's farm, but aside from that, I couldn't think of anything. The reason they were asking, they said, was that in several close encounters, the people had been in rural areas where they were exposed to nitrates or nitrate fertilizer. Then it hit us. Betty had left the bone meal fertilizer in the trunk before the trip and I hadn't bothered to take it out. Now, who knows? Maybe it does have significance, maybe it doesn't. It was interesting that they should bring it up when we had forgotten all about it. And they asked a lot of other questions that started me thinking. Questions like, did we have anything new in the car? Any new object and had it disappeared? There had been reports, apparently, of people having close sightings and something they had recently purchased had disappeared. They asked if anything had disappeared out of our car, but this was two months later, and we had a lot of junk in there, and I couldn't remember. Although Betty didn't realize it at the time, she did in fact have something disappear. She had been wearing earrings at the time of her encounter, and after her encounter they were missing. This was a fact she wasn't aware of until the earrings reappeared mysteriously inside a pile of leaves on the kitchen table. This was actually shortly after the visit with Homan and Jackson that the earrings reappeared. The house was unoccupied at the time, so Betty had no idea how these earrings could have reappeared. But like Barney, Betty was really puzzled by Homan and Jackson's question about nitrates. As Betty says, and I quote, their questions were so far out that I just couldn't see what relationship they had to our experience. And this business of nitrates, at that time I had all kinds of plants in the house. In fact, in the living room I had an avocado tree that touched the ceiling. They walked around, looked my plants over, and asked me what kind of fertilizer I used on them and things like this. So in their book on the Hills case, Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin write about the possible fertilizer connection. As they write, he, meaning Homan, 
asked Barney if he or anyone in his family had any association with the nitrates industry. The unexpected out-of-context question elicited, elicited a response of mild un He, Homan, asked Barney if he or anyone in his family had any association with the nitrates industry. The unexpected out-of-context question elicited a response of mild annoyance in Betty. Then she realized she did have nitrates in the trunk of her car, a bag of fertilizer. Betty wondered why the occupant of an extraterrestrial craft would be drawn to nitrates. During her lifetime, this question was never satisfactorily answered. So this remains the question. Could the presence of fertilizer have been a factor? Because it's clear that Homan and Jackson thought there might be a connection and that they had uncovered previous cases which apparently did have this connection. So as you can see, this connection in that case certainly has not been fully verified. But there are other cases. And there's another case I'd like to talk about that is pretty well known. You may have heard of it. This occurred in Tioga City in New York, actually in a smaller area outside of Tioga called Newark Valley. And the main witness in this case is a dairy farmer by the name of Gary T. Wilcox. And he had an encounter with a landed UFO and occupants, actually talked to them for almost two hours. And yes, there is a very strong fertilizer connection in this case. At 10 a.m. on April 24, 1964, Tioga City dairy farmer Gary T. Wilcox was spread, spreading fertilizer in his fields in Newark Valley. As he approached one of the fields, which was surrounded on three sides by trees, he was startled to see a large metallic object sitting in the center of the field and for a second, he thought it was an old refrigerator, but as he approached, he saw that the shape was wrong. He thought it might be a fuel tank that had fallen from a plane, but as he got even closer, he could see it was a large egg-shaped object, 20 feet long and 16 feet wide. He said it was made of shiny metal, metal and had no apparent windows or doors, but suddenly, however, two small male humanoids appeared standing next to the craft. They were dressed in seamless uniforms with hoods that covered even their faces, and each was carrying a tray that was heaped full of earth that had been apparently removed from Gary's field. So as he approached, one of these figures looked up and spoke in flawless English, informing them to have no fear. They said that they were actually from the planet we call Mars, and that they had already contacted several other people. Uh, Wilcox thought for a second there that somebody was playing a joke on him, but these figures proceeded to ask him all kinds of questions. They actually gave him a prediction that a U.S. astronaut would die. This turned out to come true. Uh, but they appeared to be interested in the fertilizer that Wilcox was sp spreading throughout the field and asked him how it affected the growth of plants. And they said that they got their nourishment from the atmosphere. And they then asked if Wilcox would give them a bag of fertilizer. And he agreed. And he actually turned to go retrieve the fertilizer. And as he left, the craft suddenly took off. So he returned with a bag of fertilizer anyway, which he left in the field. And when he checked the next day, it was gone. So he knew that this was an unusual experience. It was pretty clear to him that this was not military, and he felt it was his duty to notify the police, which he did. And seeing that he was sincere, the police referred him to UFO researchers, and before long, his case began to generate considerable interest. And when Betty, Betty and Barney Hill were discovered to have had a bag of fertilizer in their car, this was more uh, possible evidence of a fertilizer connection. So Gary Wilcox was extensively interviewed by researchers and no inconsistencies could be found in his case. And as Gary Wilcox says in an interview, I don't care whether anyone believes me or not. 
It doesn't mean anything to me one way or the other. I told them, the police, what I saw and heard, and I thought I should. And in another interview, when he was asked what he thought of people who didn't believe his story, he said, I know what I saw. We talked for two hours, and we were even joking at times. I just don't worry about it. I've got nothing to hide, and if I saw another one today, I would report it. So despite the bizarre aspects of this case, by all indications, it's true. And in fact, Gary Wilcox's brother, Floyd, was interviewed as a character witness and said of his brother, if Gary says this thing happened, it really happened. He has nothing to gain and a lot to lose by telling a story like this. I know it to be true. And in fact, researchers interviewed Gary's neighbors, who all said he was an upstanding citizen. Researcher Marcus Loth has looked into this case, uh, particularly the fertilizer connection, and as he says, and I quote, it is perhaps the most mundane aspects of this encounter, as is often the case, that provide it with the authenticity that appears to envelop this particular incident. An encounter that would very much appear to be a cosmic reconnaissance mission, one to gather information about organic materials of planet Earth, as well as the intricacies and knowledge of farming and rules of agriculture. The encounter of Gary Wilcox is certainly one of the most intriguing of its era. So again, further confirmation of Wilcox's case is the fact that the prediction given to him regarding the death of an astronaut did come true. And despite the bizarre elements of this case, it's considered a classic. Gary actually said that there were certain details he was not going to reveal because they were too personal or too sensitive and that he was going to be investigated by the Air Force. And what I'd like to do is play a small clip, a short clip, of an interview this farmer, Gary Wilcox, did. And this audio clip is about six minutes long, but you'll be able to hear Gary Wilcox in his own words as he describes his encounter. About 10 o'clock in the morning, I spread a load of manure. Found a hay field up back the barn there, and I kept seeing this glitter and thing. It was about a pretty near a mile away, I guess, up on top of the hill. There's nothing in view. I mean, in the way, it's all open ground, and there's an old icebox up there where there's something reflected off of that. It looked just like a mirror shining in my face there, and I was going up the top of that hill to see if I was ready to plow anyway, and I drove on up with the tractor, and uh, as I got up there about 100 feet of this glistening thing, it, I could see what it was. Well, it was, well, I got 100, 200 yards from it there, and I couldn't see nothing. There wasn't no shining or nothing, but as I went closer, I got almost within 100 feet before I saw anything. This is all, uh, when I took off, was about 100 feet, and I couldn't see it. It was gone, I mean, uh, but it looked like a wing tank to me at first. I seen them when I was in the service quite a bit, uh, fuel tanks off these planes. It was more egg-shaped than anything. It was about 20 foot long, 15 or 16 foot wide, and about 4 foot deep. How close did you get to it? Mm, a couple inches. I was touching it for about two hours. What did the surface look like it was made out of? Oh, Aluminum colored, whitish colored, it had a whitish cast to it, but it wasn't bright. It was, it was shiny, but it wasn't real bright. It was just like a dish of some kind of cooking dish, really, about what it was. Now, did a door open before these people came out of it? How did they appear? How did you meet the little men? Well, I don't know. I was feeling another thing there. I was just getting ready to come back down, call the sheriff up, and see if something had fallen off an airplane, but. I was kind of wondering, too, because it was off the ground. It was about four foot off the ground. It had this idling noise. And, uh, I don't know, nothing happened. I was touching it there for a couple of minutes, and I was just getting ready to go, and from underneath it someplace, I don't know, these two things or men or whatever they are came. They were about four foot high. I don't know what they are or what they, who they were, but they talked to me for about two hours up there. Hmm. Do you could perfectly understand them, Yeah, then. they talk better English than you're talking. Uh -huh. Did they talk with any kind of an accent? No, no accent or nothing. I spoke German and Russian when I was in the service, and was well, nothing like either one of them. Well, first thing they said was, don't be alarmed. We have talked to people before. And they were questioning uh, 
how I had seen him and stuff, they were quite concerned. They said I shouldn't have seen him within 100 feet or so. And then when I told them I saw him way down where I was putting manure, I was putting him a mile away. They were quite concerned. They said I shouldn't have seen him in the daytime like that. That's why they were in the daytime. Well, they said that they were traveling this hemisphere, this chip. They were, they had, each one had a tray in their hand. That's right. Full of grass and stuff. It was side looked like they took the knife and cut it right out of the ground, just a slab of it in each tray. And that's what they were doing. They started collecting organic material and stuff. Where do they say they were from? Well, <laughs> I mean, this sounds awful silly, I know, but uh, they told me they were from what I know as a planet Mars. Every time they spoke of stuff, they referred it to it as I know, mm -hmm. or as we know here, like as we know Earth, as we know Mars and stuff like that. You sound like you find it rather hard to believe yourself. Well, I know. I was up there for two hours. I was touching the thing and talking to somebody. I don't know who it was. And you say you talked to them for about two hours? Oh, it was probably an hour and a half. I was up there about two hours altogether. Well, I, I talk about a lot of stuff. Some of the stuff I can't say anything about. Some of them I can, but, uh... Uh... They were talking about the people were silly to go into space, that they would never survive there, just as they can't survive here, they said. They can only make a trip out every two years, the two that were here. That they can't stay in this atmosphere, that Earthmen would have even a harder time than they do, because they, they were telling me they're much farther advanced in this kind of stuff than we are. But they were more interested in agriculture, aspects of agriculture, and anything. They asked me what I was doing about the manure, and what I was where I got it and what it did and all that stuff. They didn't know nothing about agriculture. They don't have no organic material or anything like that up there. They said they survive in what they get out of the atmosphere they have. And did they you didn't stress any point. They made a lot of statements like that, but they never stressed the point. They didn't say how they lived or anything like that. Did you say that there were other things they told you that you cannot reveal? Yeah, no, I mean... Why not? Why can't you reveal these other things? Oh, well, I guess I better not say about it. Why? Well, this is being investigated into yet. Who's investigating it? Well, it's supposed to be the Air Force supposed to be coming around, I guess, from what the sheriff says. You can't tell us what they told you? No, I shouldn't, uh, for my own personal reasons. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an indication of what it was? What, no. What did it concern? Well, it concerned them being here more than anything. Did these creatures have features like we do on Earth? They have eyes well, and... They were about four foot tall, and they mm. had arms and legs and heads, but where they had features, I would presume so. They just had a complete uniform, covered everything. I mean, oh. as far as seeing features, you couldn't see anything. The voice come from it, from the front one someplace. I don't know, couldn't say it come from the head, or couldn't say it come from the stomach, or where. I just could hear the voice come from it someplace. He was about four or five feet away from me. What color were the uniforms? Same color as the ship. Sort of like a space suit. Well, it was the same color. I didn't touch the uniforms, but they looked to me like the same kind of stuff. They seemed to go back underneath the ship. The back one went first, and this front one turned around. They both went back underneath the ship, and where they went to, I don't know. It was only about 60 seconds, and the thing took off. And I was standing about six inches from it when it took off. So that's the case that I think really cements this bizarre connection between ETs and fertilizer. But there are other cases. And there's a really unusual and truly bizarre case that I don't think most people have heard of. And this took place in Irapueta, Mexico, and involves a farmer by the name of Jose Carmen Garcia, who apparently had a contact with a gentleman who had contact with extraterrestrials and learned some very interesting things about how to grow giant produce. This is a bizarre case, but it's apparently pretty well verified, as we shall see. So again, this case is all about a humble farmer by the name of Jose Carmen Garcia. He was born in 1930, and when he was 17 years old, this is 1947, so that's a significant year for UFOs, he was 17 years old and struggling to work his small three-acre farm in Irapuato, Mexico. He had inherited the farm from his father, but was really having trouble making ends meet. But his luck changed for the better when he says he met a mysterious stranger who shared an incredible secret with him. 
this stranger told Garcia a fantastic story that he had been held captive, he said, by tall, fair-skinned humanoids living in an underground base beneath a volcano in Mexico. There's definitely a volcano UFO connection, so this is kind of interesting. But according to this stranger, the humanoids nourished themselves from oversized vegetables and that this stranger was able to obtain a, quote, secret formula from the ETs, which after his experience he was able to use to grow vegetables of incredible size. And this stranger actually sketched the formula for Garcia on a scrap of paper. This consisted of strange hieroglyphic symbols, and the stranger told Garcia to basically concentrate on the symbols for a period of time and then, quote, the message would become clear. As the man says, and I quote, concentrate on these writings and in time you will understand their meaning. It is a magic formula and by using it you will feed the world. So strange, yes, but Garcia followed the man's inst instructions and to his amazement this formula actually worked. His farm not only began to flourish, he began to produce giant vegetables. We're talking like 10-pound onions, cabbages three feet wide and weighing up to 60 pounds, collard greens up to five feet long and two feet wide, and more. So Garcia began selling his vegetables at the local market in Valle de Santiago. And not surprisingly, this caused a local sensation. Garcia's fame grew very quickly as the locals gathered to marvel at his supersized produce. And they were interviewed, of course, and they said who the vegetables that they had eaten were actually very tasty and nutritious. And Garcia claimed that the incredible growth of his plants was due to this secret formula and that he used ordinary seeds and no fertilizer at all. So the connection with fertilizer is somewhat tenuous here, but it's the same subject. So I thought it was, you know, deserved in being included here. At any rate, this formula's secret apparently is mostly mental. And Garcia's accomplishments caught the attention of authorities who tried to duplicate his abilities uh, because we, there are many photographs of these giant uh, produce. And in 1978, an agricultural ministry official hired agricultural experts and local farmers and they were able to produce about 30 tons of produce per acre. Garcia, however, far exceeded them at 106 tons per acre, so more than three times better. His fame grew very quickly when his story was published in the Era Puerto newspaper, El Alacran, and the Mexican magazine, Impacto. And news actually spread to the United States when a gentleman by the name of Bill Robinson, an information officer for San Diego, the San Diego, California Police Department, he traveled to Irapueto on vacation and personally met with Jose Carmen Garcia. And in fact, Garcia gave Robinson a giant onion, which he transported back to the United States. And Robinson eventually told the story of his meeting with Garcia in the well-known magazine, San Diego Home and Garden. So as fantastic as Garcia's story sounds, the existence of these gargantuan vegetables is undisputed. And as I said, there are many photos, m many of which were taken by Oscar Arredondo, a ph photographer. And these photos show Garcia and others posing with his humongous vegetables. UFO researcher Chet Dembeck actually looked into this case. Uh, it's from him that I heard about it. And as he writes, and I quote, In the UFO community, there's always clamoring for proof, proof, and more proof of UFOs and extraterrestrials, yet very little is ever produced. In this strange case, the only proof he offers is giant veggies that have scientists scratching their collective heads in wonderment. So there you go, a very strange case, but apparently undisputed. 
I couldn't find a whole lot of cases that really cemented this fertilizer connection, but there are a few out there. There was another case that occurred on May 15, 1988, and this was in Borger, Texas. This is a pretty brief case, but I think it could be significant and definitely points towards a possible connection here. So this case may have only peripheral significance to this subject, but it's very interesting because on May 15, 1988, at 11.20 a.m., a witness saw a UFO over the Agrium Fertilizer Plant in Borger, Texas. And according to the anonymous witness, he observed a, quote, solid chrome disc fly directly over the plant, which at the time was closed for repairs. And as the witness says, it was moving at a pace of 50 to 60 miles per hour. It was so close. I could make out the object very clearly. No noise was emitted. So it's an interesting case, but it's not really evident that the object showed any particular interest in the fertilizer plant itself, but it did fly directly over it. The next case I'd like to talk about definitely shows a connection between UFOs and fertilizer and ETs being interested in fertilizer. And this took place in Winstead, Connecticut on February 21st, 1968. And this is pretty well verified in that it was researched by major investigators such as Walter Webb, Ted Bletcher, and others. So let's just dive into this case and see what it has to tell us. The main witness in this case is a young girl by the name of Miss Amato. She's 12 years old. And again, this was investigated by Ted Bletcher, David Webb, and Lawrence Fawcett. It occurred on February 21st, 1968 in Winstead, Connecticut. And it all began when Miss Amato heard a strange bloop, bloop, bloop noise outside the window of her home. And her bedroom actually overlooked an abandoned railroad station, which was then being used as a storage site for ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Hovering close to the ground beside the building, Miss Amato saw a white egg-shaped object about the size of the family station wagon. And as she watched, this craft emitted a short beam of light at a downward angle, much like a ramp, she said. And at that point, 15 or 20 little men, each about three feet tall, exited the craft via the ramp. They walked in single file and jumped from the end of the beam to the ground, each was dressed in a dull silver jumpsuit and wore a fishbowl type helmet. Miss Amato observed them as they proceeded to climb up the side of the building, housing the fertilizer one after another using a hand over hand motion, almost as if they had suction cups on their hands. But upon reaching the roof, they spread out in different directions and these little guys appeared to be looking down inside the building through a skylight. At this point, the witness became frightened by what she was seeing and ran to her bed, hiding under the covers. But the investigators were very much impressed with her testimony, even more so because later that night, there was in fact another report in Winstead, Connecticut. It was just one hour later, just past midnight, when Ms. Cecilia Brewer and five companions were driving home from work between Winstead and Barkhamstead. Their car engine started to fail, and looking ahead of them, they saw a silver-colored domed disc hovering along the left-hand side of the highway, just over a forest clearing. They viewed this object from a distance of about 100 feet and observed a cone of white light coming from the bottom. The dome of the object was lined with rectangular windows, which emitted a green light. They watched this object for about 15 minutes, at which point it flew away. So this is further confirmation of Amato's encounter, given that it occurred so cl close to her encounter and at pretty much the same time. Another case that points towards E.T.'s interest in fertilizer comes from an anonymous gentleman who posted his sighting to MUFON 
and he had an interesting encounter in Lee Summit, Missouri. And after seeing UFOs on more than one occasion in this area, he was curious as to why this area was so active. And so he started to do an investigation and found out some interesting things. So the main witness in this case I call Stan. He is anonymous. But on August 31st, 2014, at 8.15 p.m., he observed a glowing orb near Lee's Summit, Missouri. And as the witness says, and I quote, From my first observation of it, the light given off was really quite brilliant and more yellowish. The rays which emanated from it also had a peculiar quality that I normally do not see with light. There was a definition to the rays, and they came to a point. So he actually managed to capture the orb on video, and intrigued by this encounter, he began to study reports of orbs looking for patterns. And he did find an interesting pattern. As he says, and I quote, One of the commonalities is that they appear in areas which are rich in phosphorus, such as certain coast water and other waterways which have run off from fertilizer. Other coincidences of high orb sightings occur during the 4th of July celebrations due to the phosphorus in fireworks. So phosphorus is an ingredient often used in fertilizer, and Stan began researching the phosphorus levels in the area where he saw the orb, and he found what he believes is a correlation. As he says, and again I quote, It is now obvious that at least two areas of known phosphorus activity in bodies of water in the Independence Blue Springs Lee's Summit area are also areas of orange orb activity. Both areas are not restricted, however, to sightings of orange orbs. Many other types of craft happen to frequent the area. So perhaps this is further indication of UFOs and ET's interest in fertilizer. So there could very well be a connection here, but the connection is not super strong. There aren't a whole lot of cases. Uh, phosphorus is, of course, a element that does turn up quite a bit in UFO landing cases. And, of course, it is a major ingredient of fertilizer. Interestingly, it's also one of the common elements inside the human body. But there are a number of cases where phosphorus does seem to turn up during UFO landings. And there was a very famous case in Voronezh, Russia, which did apparently have a phosphorus connection. And this occurred on April 24th, 1989. Again, the Voronezh, Russia UFO landing case occurred on April 24th, 1989. It's very well known, so I won't get too much into it. I already did an episode on UFO landing trace cases. So if you want to hear more about this case, you might want to check that out. But I would like to quote researcher Ans Shristava, who had a very interesting insight. As he says, The most interesting fact of all is that the depressions in the ground showed that the object weighed several tons. Radiation was found in the soil, as were unusually high levels of certain elements, in particular phosphorus. So once again, here's this weird connection. Another case involving a UFO landing with a phosphorus connection comes from Uruguayan researcher Daniel Iglesias. And this is another landing in which phosphorus turns up. As researcher Daniel Iglesias writes, and I quote, In a case in the department of Durazno, a witness reported a UFO landing and soil analysis showed an increase in the values of minerals such as chromium, manganese, phosphorus, and carbon, enabling researchers to conclude that the event had indeed been real. Another case involving a UFO landing with a phosphorus connection was reported by researcher Albert Rosales, who wrote a wonderful series of books called Humanoids Amongst Us, and he reports on a case that occurred in Georgia, Russia, which does apparently, again, have this weird connection. So this next case was reported to the TASS News Service, and 
again involved landing traces. This was on July 6, 2002, and Albert Rosal Rosales did publish a summary of the case, and as he writes, not far from the location where the encounter had taken place, several peasants found deeply pressed down grass slightly burned at the edges and circle-shaped. Witnesses also reported finding strange crumb-like particles which emitted phosphorus light for several days in a row. So these cases are all landing cases which do seem to show this weird phosphorus connection. Again, we are really left with more questions than answers, but such is the nature of the UFO phenomenon. So those are pretty much all the cases I could find involving the ET fertilizer connection. I did write about this in my new book, Not From Here, Volume 4. So if you want to get into a little more depth with these cases and other bizarre aspects of UFO research, you definitely might want to check that out. And uh, yeah, I think this shows an area of UFO research that hasn't been explored. And while there aren't a lot of cases, some definitely seem to point towards ET's interest in fertilizer or agriculture in general. In a previous volume of my Not From Here series, I did a chapter on extraterrestrial gardeners, and there are hundreds upon hundreds of cases where people have seen UFOs and humanoids collecting plant samples. So that could be a connection here. And I will briefly mention that contactee Howard Menger, a sign painter from New Jersey, whose case is quite controversial, but his book, From Outer Space to You, does talk about ET's interest in agriculture and how they are able to grow uh, produce. Uh, and uh, he devoted quite a bit of uh, space in his book to this sort of agriculture fertilizer connection and the ET's interest in it. So for what it's worth, I thought I would mention that. But yeah, there does seem to be a connection, but mm, I'm going to say it's tenuous at best with the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of reports. I was hoping I would find more, but the cases like the Tioga City uh, case in New York definitely show that there's an interest there. Uh, I do wonder about the Betty and Barney Hill case and the others I've cited, but at this point I can't really say for sure that there is a strong connection, but there is definitely some interest on part of the ETs. So that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to thank you once again for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for the truth. And more importantly, keep having fun.